has replayed the morning of April 16th, 2007 in his head countless times. I've thought about that, that day every single which way, from me getting killed to me saving the day. But each time, he gets back to the same conclusion. The from those toughest times can come the most valuable lessons. Colin Goddard is a survivor of the Virginia Tech massacre, one of the deadliest shootings by a single gunman in U.S. history, which killed 32 of his classmates. Now, he works to spread awareness about gun safety and lobby against bills like Arizona's SB 1467, which would allow students and faculty to carry concealed weapons on college campuses. It's all about, um, you know, spreading the message and help advocating. Republican Senator Ron Gold sponsored the bill, arguing that a sign won't stop a criminal from bringing a gun on campus, insisting people have the right to defend themselves. In 2010, there were several school shootings around the country leading some to call for increased regulation on guns, and leading others to ask how we might increase the safety of public schools. Early in 2011, the Arizona legislature responded to these concerns by introducing legislation authorizing teachers to carry firearms in class and allowing students to carry firearms at the state's colleges and universities. This bill failed to draw enough support to get out of committee. Normally, this would kill a bill, but the bill resurfaced as an amendment to another bill, skipping the normal committee steps of hearings and financial review. Once brought to the floor, the bill passed. It was then sent to the Senate, where it also passed. The governor at the time, Jan Brewer, vetoed the bill, which ended that effort that year. The next year, a similar measure was again proposed, this time beginning in the Senate. Once again, the bill died in committee, only to resurface again as an amendment to a different bill, again skipping the committee and going straight to a floor vote. This time, the amendment did not pass, so no floor vote occurred. Throughout the 2012 legislative session, people on both sides of this issue continued to monitor every floor vote of every bill expecting the guns on campus issue to again resurface as an amendment. People began referring to the guns on campus bill as a zombie bill because it kept moving forward after it should have been dead. The guns on campus bills illustrate that the formal process of legislation can differ a great deal from the way laws are actually passed. This video will discuss both formal and the informal processes of how a bill becomes a law. Even legislators have a learning curve. When they first come to office, it takes time for them to understand the process. So when I was elected as a freshman, I learned a lot of important things about the legislative process. I had been engaged on a lot of levels, and so I, I had some familiarity with the process. I knew what I was walking into, and I knew that I was walking into a minority that oftentimes didn't have a voice. So I think for me, one of the most important lessons of that freshman term was how to work across the aisle and, uh, and get things done for the constituents in my district. And that was, I think, how I was able to get not one but two bills in my freshman term passed by the supermajority Republican legislature and signed by Governor Brewer. And I've um, carried that forward and been able to work on some other important legislation in a bipartisan way throughout my legislative tenure. The textbook process is neat and tidy. You go from the start to the end with lots of places the bill can be blocked from moving forward. But real life is different. That's what we call the informal or actual process of how a bill becomes a law. It is like the reality of a Pinterest project. It is actually very messy and complicated. There's a big difference between what we see in the textbook and what we see that happens here on the House floor. I think textbooks often do a real concise job. You know, as an educator, we often see, you know, 
there's a vote, you know, it, the, the bill goes to committee, then from committee it goes to the, the, you know, the whole House body or the whole Senate body, and they decide and they vote on what they want to do. But what is missed sometimes in the textbooks are all the little conversations that happen outside of this room I'm sitting in right now, that happen outside of the House chamber, that happen in uh, party leadership meetings, or that happen in committee meetings, and all those conversations happen and a lot of decisions are made before those legislators come into this room. And so you might hear some of those debates and the talking points that hit the House floor, and those are really important to pay attention to, but a whole lot of minds aren't changed here in this chamber. Those decisions are usually made outside of this room, and I think sometimes textbooks gloss over and we paint a very you know, step-by-step -step process of how those bills are made, but I think there's a lot of you know, areas where they don't happen in front of us in the legislative setting. The real life process of drafting legislation is very different than what you would read in a textbook. In a textbook, you'll read that the legislative process is very process oriented. There's different steps and uh, different votes that have to be taken. In reality, in real life, the legislative process is all about human relationships. It's all about who you know and what they're telling you and how much you trust them, whether that's a lawmaker's relationship with another member, whether that's a lawmaker's relationship with a lobbyist or an interest group or staff or a constituent. The legislative process is all about human emotions, human relationships, and how the different members get along with each other. There's a world of difference between the textbook version and the real life version. And the truth is, until you actually walk it, and this isn't just with political science, this is gonna be life in general. Until you're actually walking the life of whatever it is, whether it's in the political world or, or in the uh, uh, private uh, business world, there's nothing like real world experience. So until you can experience what it's like to interact with two other branches of government and colleagues across the aisle and different chambers, in the case of the legislature, and different layers of government, so city and county and federal, you can read it in theory, but it's just far more complex because what, what the text doesn't capture is personality. Timing is everything. To be successful, you need to get started before the legislative session begins on the second Monday of every January. We get a lot of kind of form emails, and most people communicate by email to their legislators. And those forms that you just kind of like sign your name and then it generates this email that we get hundreds and hundreds of, that is probably the least effective way to communicate. And again, that face-to-face -face interaction is, is probably the most effective. But start that process early on. Go talk to the people that are campaigning for office before they even get elected to find out how they're going to vote on your issues that you care about or what they're going to do about them. And start that relationship early so that when you go to their office to have that face-to-face -face meeting, they're going to know who you are and know what your issue is. You have that, you're starting that relationship early and that's really the way that people can be most effective with the legislature. Now, learning about new issues is something we're constantly doing. We have stacks of information being mailed to us from various interest groups out there saying, hey, here's a problem we're seeing, whether it's in your state or other states, and here are some potential solutions, or constituents calling us up and saying, hey, here's what I'm dealing with, uh, whether it be a, a business regulation or, or uh, navigating some complexity in government. And so uh, there are a lot of different ways that information comes at us, and honestly, we're not usually hurting uh, for information. We usually get more than we need. And that's really our function. Our function here is to be able to focus on all the different sides of the different issues and make the best decision we can. Everyone else out there, you know, uh, working and raising their family and going about their day-to-day -day lives, they're trusting us uh, to make those decisions. And sometimes trust can be a challenge in a, in a political climate like we have, but there's no lack of information coming at us as legislators. And another thing, there can be a lot of closed door meetings. The real life process in Arizona can lack transparency. The political process is not as neat and clean and as tidy as we think it is when we read it in a textbook. I'm a government teacher. Every year I teach about how bills are made and you know it's a very step-by-step -step process. But what you notice when you go to the legislative system is that it's not nearly as neat and tidy as that is because there have to be all sorts of conversations that take place in order to get members from one party to maybe vote on the budget that the other party wants to put in place. There are lots of conversations that happen uh, in 
sometimes budgets are passed late in the evening. Those final decisions aren't made always right out in front of everybody. A lot of those decisions are made in committees, and then those committees send those, those budgets or those needs to the full House or the full Senate, and some of those decisions are already made before they come to the full body. One of the lessons I've learned is you can't just sit in the main legislative body. You really have to pay attention to what's going on in all the committees. You have to pay attention to where all these different House members and Senate members are at and, and what their viewpoints are, because all of those play into what the final outcome of a bill is or the final outcome of a budget uh, and the direction of the House and Senate and what they put forward for the governor to sign really comes down to all these little pieces coming together. And it's not always as neat and tidy as we think it is. And so we just have to pay attention. It's more than just going, and I think that we oftentimes leave state politics aside or what happens in the state legislature aside. We think that the national government is more important, but really most of our lives, uh, what we do every day is impacted by what happens at the state legislative body and, and at the state capitol. And so we have to pay attention to all those little things in order to understand what those final outcomes are going to be here. Probably the most important thing for successfully navigating the informal process is your relationships. Whether you agree with people or not on every issue, getting to know folks who have different views than you do, different opinions than you do, and appreciating their perspective, even if you disagree with it, is critical. Not only for maintaining civility, but just frankly for reaching compromise and agreement. So the number one thing you can do is to make sure that you don't let differences of opinion or even different values be a barrier in having relationships with those on the other side. Third, the textbook process does not account for how citizen and interest group involvement can dramatically alter a situation. Interest groups play a critical role in the legislative process by educating and informing members about legislation that they'll be voting on. It's important to remember that these lawmakers are voting on literally dozens and sometimes hundreds of bills each week, and they don't have the time or the capacity to become experts in all of the policy areas that these bills deal with. It's incumbent upon interest groups to be represented at the Capitol, typically by lobbyists, to help these members understand these issues and to educate them and inform them so that they have a better comprehension of the issues that they'll be voting on. Although interest groups and lobbyists are often maligned and denigrated for their work, and there's definitely a stereotypical uh, preconception of what a lobbyist is and what an interest group does, the reality is that lobbyists and the interest groups they represent play a critical role. And I think it's important to note also that lobbyists are not just a corporate phenomenon. The teachers union or unions have lobbyists. School boards have lobbyists. School district business officials have lobbyists. Environmental groups have lobbyists. They span the political spectrum and span uh, different ideologies. Virtually all interest groups are represented at the Capitol and they play an important role that most members are very appreciative and grateful for. Some of it is very obvious. Uh, when you have, for instance, 50,000 people marching on the Capitol, <laughs> that's a real easy one. But you know, beyond that, it's really uh, just a case-by-case -case situation. So when your uh, committees are meeting and people are coming down to those committees and, and testifying in committees, we get lots of familiar faces, certain lobbyists or groups that come down, and, and we see them all the time. But when you start to see uh, sort of the average person who doesn't normally participate come coming down and, and involving themselves in the process and making their ideas and their thoughts and their voice heard, that really does make a difference. And we will start to perk up a little bit more because it's so unusual. And we assume that, that they represent a number of people out there in the general public that feel that way. If I were to give folks some tips on navigating the informal process of how bills are passed and how legislation happens, really you just want to be involved. You want to be able to be at the Capitol. Come down, find out what's going on in those different uh, legislative hearings, and you want to be able to sit down in those committee hearings and find out who's, who's opposing a bill, who's supporting a bill, because you can really see more of the debates happen in those bodies than they do in larger full chamber debates. And so I would say that that's really important, and really it's important to be plugged in. There's a lot of reporters who report on what happens at the Capitol, and it's really important for voters and it's really important for people who, who want to have an impact on what goes on in Arizona at the legislature and, and at the Capitol that they read, that they find out what's happening, that they read those news articles, follow some of those reporters on Twitter, follow them on social media, 
find out what they're doing and what they've learned about the process so that you can be an informed voter, so that you can be an informed person, so that you can have an impact on what happens here at the Capitol. Fourth, you really do need to have the support of leadership. They need to view a proposed bill as aligned with their vision or agenda for the state. Party leaders work very closely with committee chairs, so it's a good idea to get the support and buy-in from the majority leaders and committee. So one of the most important aspects of my role as a party leader here at the House, as, as Speaker of the House, is just keeping everything going. There are so many opportunities in the process as people get worked up about issues where we can get bogged down and you make no progress whatsoever. So just keeping the wheels turning, keeping the process moving is probably one of the most fundamental things that I do as Speaker of the House. And it may not be something that people in the general public are even aware because usually they see me doing an interview on a particular issue and don't realize all that goes on in the legislative process that frankly is, is pretty mundane or, or much more behind the scenes. Uh, and has nothing to do with policy and really is not controversial at all. But managing the staff, uh, managing the process, uh, that is something that a lot of people don't really see and it's probably one of the most important things that I do as Speaker of the House. So having citizens and people of any community participate in the legislative process is hugely important. One of the things that happens is a lot of times the citizens will find problems or challenges, something that affects them personally because a law that's been passed or not, and they're not really aware of the entire process intimately. And so as party leaders, whether they're Democrat party leaders, Libertarians, Green Party, Democrats, you name it, any uh, Republicans, any particular group, ultimately what you want them to do is to engage the voters in the process and not just how to vote and to participate, but as the citizens, as citizens of a community, to engage in the process of legislation because ultimately what you find out is that the legislative process will impact people intimately, but they don't know. A lot of times they don't know what's happening with the bill, they hear about it, sounds good, but they don't understand really what's happening to them until it passes and get there. So we wanna engage people. So legislative bodies as well as parties should have a responsibility to reach out to the people and help them become aware of the entire legislative process, especially leading up to laws that are gonna govern their behavior. Fifth. A bill can be resurrected or brought to life at surprising points in the process. One favorite method is the strike all amendment, where a bill is stripped of everything but its number and replaced with entirely different text. If such an amendment is passed on the floor, the bill essentially bypasses the entire process, whether it is a new bill or a dead one brought back to life. Citizens can and do influence the informal process so long as they cultivate relationships. Another great way people can convey their policy ideas is to come down to the legislature. All of our hearings are open to the public as well as our floor sessions. People can have a chance to see it, how it actually happens down here and see how things unfold. We have information desks in both the House and the Senate um, where you can go and ask questions and, and get an idea of what's happening that day. There's no single most effective way for constituents and members of the public to communicate with state lawmakers. But some things to keep in mind are, first of all, that these state lawmakers are extremely busy, especially during legislative session. They have committees, they have floor sessions, they have private meetings with other members, with lobbyists, with staff. Their days are very full. And in the midst of all that, they're being bombarded with hundreds of email messages and phone calls that, quite frankly, they don't have enough either time or staff support to, uh, to filter through and to get through every day. So some principles to keep in mind uh, when we communicate with members is first of all to be respectful. A disrespectful email or phone call is not going to accomplish your objective of communicating with a member or convincing them to do something that you would like them to do. Being respectful of their time, being respectful of their position is always a much more effective 
way of communicating. There are some good examples of how this has made an impact. When you have citizens united to get something together, whether it's passing a bond in an override in a local school election where citizens come together and they say, we want this for our school. We, we want schools that look like this. They can go out and, and they can ask their community to support a bond or over an override for a school to generate funds in order to get textbooks, in order to get new buses, in order to refurbish buildings, and they can have that direct connection, and they can really change what happens. Uh, at a larger level, at a state level, when citizens participate and they come down to the legislative body, and they can ask questions of the legislators. They can actually sit in on some of those hearings, and they can speak to legislators about bills and about what they want to see happen or not happen. And so they can have a direct voice in even the budget. When you saw educators and community members and activists from across the state come out, stand out, and ask for uh, better education funding in the state, that community support, that activist support, that education support of community members really made those things happen. In the last few years, there have been a number of examples of times when interest groups have played a very important role in uh, furthering a specific piece of legislation. One that comes to mind was the debate over whether to legalize or allow Uber and Lyft ride-sharing companies to operate in Arizona. And both Uber and Lyft were extremely well represented at the Capitol by lobbyists and by consultants. The other side, uh, the, the taxi industry, if you will, the cab industry was also very well represented. And what resulted was a very vigorous and I think healthy debate between the two sides over how ride shares should be allowed and what the legal process and legal structure should be for facilitating the growth of that industry and, and making that accessible to the public. But in that specific case, again, both sides were well represented by lobbyists and consultants, and it resulted in a very vigorous and healthy debate that has now resulted in Arizonans across the state being allowed to use Uber and Lyft as they see fit. I, I would certainly say to the general populace that are out there, don't believe that you can't influence the process. Communicate with your legislators. If they are out in the community doing events, show up. Uh, if you have a question, ask them, uh, communicate with them, uh, email them, call them, do those kinds of things, because every citizen has value and they are people who legislators want to be responsive to. So I guess my, my word on that is believe you can influence the system and don't be a bit shy about trying to do it. It's my hope that those in the general public will, despite what they view as animosity and fighting and all of the drama that goes on in the political world, it's my hope that they will actually not run away from it, but engage in it. And more importantly than engaging is doing so in a civil and polite way. Sometimes it's hard to separate the political issues from the personal. But in our society, if it's to function and function well and not devolve into some sort of fight or even civil war like you see in other places in the world or in our own history. It really requires us to be willing to listen to others who have differences of opinion, to respect those differences of opinion. I will concede that perhaps one of the downsides to the social media of today is that people seem willing to tweet out or post things that they would never say to a person's face. And I think that there is a danger there in our society if we encourage that type of thing. Uh, I was raised to be nice to other people, whether I agree with them or not, and I hope we can take that, whether it's in social media or the political world, take that, uh, that perspective and make sure that not only those who are here today, but the generation that comes after us adhere to those values.